positive reactions to enger show Australia says PNG responsible for Manus Center and Thaddeus Katua goes down fighting in Rio This is National MTV News with Mirba Tolo. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Monday's news. Morobe Police Commander Chief Superintendent Augustine Wampe has confirmed reports of an armed holdup of a shop located along the Highlands Highway. The shop belongs to an Asian businessman. Police believe seven armed men held up the shop's security guards and stole 5,000 kina in total, both cash and in flex cards. The suspects are not known and police are investigating. Police say the men were armed with high-powered guns. An AR-15 and two shotguns were used to attack the shop's security guards who were stationed at the shop's entrance. They forced their way in and stole 2,000 kina cash and 3,000 kina worth of flux cards. Provincial Police Commander Chief Superintendent Agustin Wampe says the suspects used two 10-seater vehicles. One was blue and the other white. They have been watching the police up and down, so, you know, people have their uh, uh, different mindsets to go and commit robbery, so... Wampe says one of the vehicles was used to keep an eye out for police, while the other was used as a getaway vehicle. There was a police car from Chifasin at the 40-mile area some time before the crime occurred. Police believe that the crime must have been committed straight after the police vehicle left the scene. Police believe the criminals must have an informant who provided them with information. Mata Luis, National MTV News, Lay. Positive reactions from the final day of the Enga show, with Engans expressing satisfaction with the turnout of the three-day cultural show. Enga Governor Peter Ipatas also used the opportunity to call on Enga student leaders of Unitech to take responsibility and ease tensions between them as the family of the murdered student Graham Romanong. For the first time in many years, the show contained only Engen groups and as the show ended yesterday, there were positive reactions to the show by those who attended. Narpla previous Enga show shall have come up. Emol Narpla district province also have come helping me plan and plus I got him Enga show. But Biblo Enga, Wabek, actually, lo, Alenki, the first time, lo, me, lo, come experience with the show. The intention of the show is meant to preserve and maintain culture. Show organizers pointed out that the traditional arts that once thrived are now being revived. Headdresses, grass skirts and kundus are being made with the knowledge of the arts being passed on to secondary schools who participated over the weekend. Me looking awesome. So blowing and come up good luck now. The event was also used by Governor Peter Ipatas to address the lingering issue of the recent murder of the Southern Highland student at Unitech. Unitech students were called to take responsibility and make peace before classes resume in September. What I told the students is to just to take responsibility because the perception is that it is the Engans. So I said, look, we must get rid of this perception. You students must take ownership, try and take responsibility, and do it in a way, in the island's way, to settle through compensation so that you can make peace. While the murder is being investigated by police, the Engen community has been called upon to make peace with their neighbours and the family of the slain student. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Wabeg. The chief migration's lawyer, Laya Skandi, told the Supreme Court this morning that PNG is in charge of the Manus Detention Center and the resettlement of the transferees. Kandi told the Chief Justice, Salomo Injia, that the Australian government will only assist with finance and technical support. The Chief Justice directed all parties involved to prepare statements and clarify in a full court an order made on April 26th, which ordered for a joint effort of the Australian and PNG government to resettle the refugees. April 26th was the date when the Supreme Court had declared the Manus Detention Center unconstitutional and ordered its closure. Up till today, the transferees are still being processed and kept in Manus. 
it has come to the Supreme Court's attention on whether or not the Australia or PNG government is in charge of the resettlement of the asylum seekers or both. Today it was made known to the Chief Justice that the PNG Immigration and the Citizenship Service Authority are responsible for and manage the asylum seeker status determination and refugee settlement process. This was a concern for the Chief Justice India who directed the parties to clarify to a full court of three judges order number no. 6 which was handed down on April 26. The order stated that both the Australian and PNG governments should take all necessary steps to seize and prevent the continued unconstitutional and illegal detention of the asylum seekers. Basenata Yama, National MTV News. Nearly 400 people have been repatriated to Simbu to allow for development in the land they have been occupying in Port Mosby's Air Transport Squadron area. A land mass of 97 hectares will be developed for housing projects, a farm and a resort. The land will be developed by nationally owned company Cory Holdings Limited. To pave way for the land to be developed, families were repatriated back to Simbu with necessary supplies to rebuild their lives. Over the weekend, progress was made with Cory Holdings launching machines to signify the development of the land with specific designs approved by the Department of Lands and NTD Physical Planning Board. The excavator and truck will be used for the first phase of the land development. And with housing a major issue for residents in Port Mosby, the major development on the piece of land will be housing estate. Principal owner of Corey Holdings Limited, Michael Corey, believes the new development will help many middle income Papua New Guineans in the city. All in the developments, so me and the developments, lady, I come up with them. Resident all and by me, like 200 and allotments. And me, by building good plants, by building regime, like 100 kinata. Other developments to be built include shopping areas, recreation facilities, churches, and a state-of-the-art resort on top of the ridges. It's a challenging project for Mr. Corey, but he says the support by his family and other stakeholders has been positive. I got a dream to blow me. I'll say so. You plan on talking about anything, but go plan, blow, plan. I'll say so. You plan looking for the next few months. This letter back, I'm up safe. Next time on what you're looking by, you're looking slated by chains. The launching was witnessed by staff of Cory, business partners, friends and other stakeholders. Jack Lapave Jr. National MTV News. Deputy Opposition Leader and Bulolo MP Sam Bassel says tariffs should be cut on imported materials used for rural electrification projects in rural Papua New Guinea. He says 80% of Papua New Guineans live in the rural areas and deserve to have power supply. Currently, rolling out a rural electrification project is expensive. Bethany Herman with this report. The Bulolo district has been rolling out rural electrification projects since 2009. Sam Basil has made a call to reduce tariffs on materials used for supplying rural power projects. Rural power supply is quite expensive to provide at the moment. On a high voltage, it costs about five. 500,000 per kilometer. Used to be 200,000 in 2009 when we started. But because we can afford three phase, we are running only two lines, which is two single phase. So um, it, it, it brings down the cost. Also, every transformer from a 15 kVA up, it costs more than 15,000 to 20, 30,000. Know? And then we're also looking at powering each house, which costs about 3,000 you know, for each house, including MSK, three bulbs of light, and add wire all the way to the switches. Basil says if tariffs are cut specifically for rural electrification, Papua New Guineans in the rural areas of the 22 provinces will have power at low costs. Uh, we cannot roll out rural electrification at the cost of the corporate uh, world out there in the urban areas. We have to find some ways by cutting costs to roll those programs out because those people in the rural areas are the reason why Port Mosby exists. Lay exists and Papua New Guinea exists. On Saturday, at the launching of electricity infrastructure in Romoron village in Bulolo district, the event was also used by Pangu Party to introduce advisor Dulcie and Sumare. We walk, I'm walk behind the solo, uh, Lobigman, 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 Lobigman
Mi stab wok bermi nop lo tok tok lo lo ayam lo kita manem lo sedang lo backside na. How mi papa sim tok tok na. How by mi look sawe lo how by mi straight him ground. Last month, Dalciana Sumare, along with Brian Kramer and retired PNGDF Commander Jerry Singerok, were appointed Pangu Party advisors. Bethany Hariman, National MTV News, Lay. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more of today's top stories after these messages. Welcome back to the news. The Papua New Guinea National Party held its official launching in Port Mosby last Friday. Unveiled at the event were the party's policy platforms and directions towards the 2017 national elections. The event was part of the party's fundraising drive. Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare speaking as an official guest speaker at the party's launching paid tribute to its founders for the contribution and support for the socio-economic development of this nation. Sir Michael said this leader's whom he had known personally in his 42 year of political career gave prominence to the party. My dealings with the National Party began with late Thomas Cavalli and uh, late Yamaki Oku, who became members of the House of Assembly. And I was, I was part of my, it was part of my cabinet, first cabinet in 1972. PNG National Party was one of the indigenous parties besides Pangu Party, United Party, People's Progress Party and Melanesian Alliance. Members of this party played important roles in the creation of this nation. As a great country, many people feared that tribalism would disunite Papua New Guinea, but they did not even show it. He said PNG's constitution unites this great nation despite having diverse cultures and traditions. He added that some provinces have longed for autonomy, however, MP should evenly distribute the country's wealth and provide services to the people to unite this nation. In preparation toward the 2017 national elections, the party's ambition is to lobby support and form the next government. Party leader Karen Gakua says St. Michael's presence indicates that he believes in the party's policies and members. The fact that he is here tonight gives, conveys a number of messages including his personal endorsement that he believes in the PNG National Party, the people and the supporters who go with it. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. Women leaders must be given fair representation in the government, says ECP Governor Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare. He urged political parties to prioritize gender balance by voting for women in the 2017 national elections. Tonight, uh, in the gems of wisdom that he will pass on, please give him a round of applause as we welcome him to the stage. Grand Chief Sir Michael Somare was the official guest speaker during the launching of the PNG National Party over the weekend. Speaking during the launch, Sir Michael strongly emphasized on empowering women leadership in the country. In the constitution, there are specific laws and legislations that govern and safeguard the rights of women to participate in politics. PNG constitution has given equal status to women since its establishment. Sadly, sadly we still have a very small number of women in positions of power in our country. National Party and all other parties must be proactive in allowing gender balance, especially in our parliament. I'm sure how we vote on the floor of parliament would be di different if we had more women representative within 111 uh, seats that we have uh, today. But he said the idea of referencing cultural taboos is restricting women from taking up leadership roles and responsibilities. I add this in my statement because we have a traditional system. I belong to the old school. We always believe the men are more important in our societies. But in modern age today, the women are the leaders. You look at the developed countries. You look at Germany today, very eminent person is running the country in Germany, Margaret Thatcher. St. Michael reiterated that despite cultural obstacles, women must be given fair and equitable representation in parliament. He said there are great women leaders of the world thus having inspired by the likes of Margaret Thatcher, Angela Merkel and Indira Gandhi. Party leader Karen Gakua acknowledged Green Chief's message saying the idea to promote and empowering women leadership is constitutional. We have uh, listened to his message. I'd like to thank him very much on, behalf of, on all our behalf uh, tonight. 
um, that he has made time to come, up, come along and give us a number of messages, including such as, for example, the importance of the role that women have to play. If this country is truly really to be a good, fair country, then we, women must be given better and better opportunities and more and more equal opportunities to everybody. Eric Garupma, National MTV News. More infrastructure is needed to support the growth of the fishing industry in Papua New Guinea. National Fisheries Authority Managing Director John Kasu expressed this while opening a 10.2 million kina learning facility for the Kaviang Fisheries College. Also launched was a fishing vessel and a research facility. The learning facility, mostly tutor rooms, was jointly funded by the National Fisheries Authority, National Planning Department and insurance secured from the College Bent Library. Over the past 10 years, little support has been given by the government. However, with a number of key policies and priorities to improve the fishing sector, the support to this college is now vital. Continuous strengthening of the college is a reflection of the continuous of the increasing demand of capacity building and training for the industry and interest for public unions to venture into the fishing industry. For the college, it has grown from strength to strength since it was molded into a premier fisheries institution in the 1990s. College principal Jeff Kins says the college is expanding given the growth for PNG's fishing sector. And building something that is uh, skilling for us here at the college, skilling uh, the workforce of the fishery sector. The college also witnessed the launch of the FTV Poker Gem, a 17-meter training vessel equipped with long line and bottom fishing equipment. That's it. The boat is handy for studies carried out by students and also for further training and research purposes. Uh, this boat now gives us the capacity uh, to take uh, students out it's to give them a commercial sort of experience of, uh, of fishing. In a separate program, head of National Fisheries Authority John Kasu opened the Nago Island Marie Culture and Research Facility, a center of excellence for the National Fisheries Authority, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Island region. Jack LaPave, Jr. National, MTV News. The lay market is in the process of a facelift for the first time. Construction is now underway, funded by National Fisheries Authority. The cost of the project is more than 750,000 kina. Construction of additional shelters funded by National Fisheries Authority will soon make life at the market comfortable for sellers to sell the produce. The market currently has only one big shelter, housing half of the sellers who sell the produce at the market. The other half, especially women, are usually seated outside of the building. Uh, we hoping that uh, we should be able to finish this quickly within the, the, the schedule time, uh, and then we should be crossing over. Uh, so first stage should roughly take us about uh, one and a half months. There are two stages to the project. This will include the construction of buildings for poultry and fish. So one building will be uh, specifically allocated for, uh, for fish products. Space has always been the concern for the vendors who wish to sell the produce at the lace main market. A representative from Morobet, Chapet Marku says the construction of additional shelters will provide enough space to cater for vendors selling outside of the main shelter. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. And now a look at the finance news. The Kina opened unchanged at 0.3155 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3080 US dollars, 0.4017 Australian dollars, 0.2747 Euro and 31.09 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold and copper closed lower, while coffee and cocoa closed the day higher. Palm oil and crude oil closed higher, while copper closed the day lower. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed at 192 points higher, the ASX is trading at 22 points higher, and the All Ordinary is trading 22 points higher. Here with National MTV News, we'll be back with more after these messages. Welcome back to National MTV News. 
Access to basic health services for the Bubuleta community in Milan Bay Province is now possible with the recent launch of the Bubuleta Community Health Post. This comes after the health department completed the facility through their development partners at a cost close to 5 million kina. This is the first community health post to be completed according to the National Health Services Standards. The health facility will cater for basic health needs of the people of Bubuleta and surrounding communities with services such as supervised labour, immunisation and treatment of emergency conditions as part of its services, its health promotion and education activities for schools and communities in the area. The health department says this type of facility is also being built in other parts of Milan Bay province and will be launched later in the year. Turning overseas now and the Islamic State has claimed responsibility for the attack on Saturday against two police officers in Charleroi, Belgium according to a statement issued on Sunday by the group's Amak News Agency. Two police officers were severely wounded in the face and neck at a security checkpoint at the entrance to a police station by a man wielding a machete and shouting Allah Akbar, God is greatest. The assailant was shot and died later in a hospital. The statement called the assailant a soldier of the Islamic State who had carried out the attack in response to calls to target citizens of countries belonging to the Crusader coalition, a reference to nations involved in the fight against the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. The language was nearly identical to claims of responsibility issued by the Islamic State for other attacks in recent weeks, including an axe attack by an Afghan refugee in Wurzburg, Germany and the killing of a priest in the Normandy region of France. The Belgian Federal Prosecutor's Office said yesterday that there were indications that the attack may have been inspired by a terrorist motive and that it had taken over the investigation from the Prosecutor's Office in Chalawa. The Federal Prosecutor's Office identified the attacker as a 33-year-old Algerian who had been living in Belgium since 2012. The office identified him only by the initials KB. France and Belgium are still on heightened alert after a network of Islamic State militants carried out attacks in November in Paris and in March in Brussels, killing a total of 162 people. Finisonite, NTV, World News. Iran has executed nuclear scientist Sharam Amiri, who was detained in 2010 when he returned home from the U.S. after a court convicted him of spying for Washington. The judiciary told a news conference that Amiri gave vital information about the country to the enemy through his United States connections. The judiciary said a court had sentenced Amiri to death and the sentence had been upheld by Iran's Supreme Court. Amiri, a university researcher working for Iran's Atomic Energy Organization, disappeared during a pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia in 2009 and later resurfaced in the United States. But he returned to Iran in 2010 and received a hero's welcome before being arrested. A U.S. official said in 2010 that Washington had received useful information from Amiri. Iran had accused the CIA of kidnapping Amiri. U.S. officials said Amiri had been free to come and go as he pleased and that he may have returned because of pressures on his family in Iran. Amiri had denied this, saying his family had no problems. In a video aired by Iranian state TV in 2010, Amiri said he had fled from U.S. agents. Iran, the United States and five other world powers reached a landmark deal last year, under which Iran agreed to limit its nuclear program in such a way as to ensure it cannot develop nuclear weapons in exchange for a lifting of economic sanctions. Panasonic, MTV World News. To the U.S. now and in the race for the White House, Donald Trump's relations with Russian President Vladimir Putin has been called into question in the New York Times. Here is what Russia is saying about Trump. Is he really the Kremlin's candidate? Certainly Russian state television is loaded with positive coverage of the Donald. This TV news anchor explains that Trump's just an eccentric billionaire who wants to make America great and normalize relations with Russia. He's often painted here as a brave political maverick who shares Russian concerns over American foreign policy and is willing to find common language with Russia's President Putin. 
whom he's praised. Between Hillary and Trump, Trump is the only one who sounds friendly, so maybe we can hope that he will be more friendly and more positive um, towards, towards Russia. And by the way, wouldn't it be nice if we actually got along with Russia? Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be nice? Much of what Trump says about Russia has left US allies aghast, but finds a welcoming audience in Moscow. Donald Trump's own foreign policy pronouncements have won him plenty of friends here in Russia. His recent suggestion that he wouldn't necessarily defend NATO allies in the event of a Russian attack raised eyebrows both in the US and here. And his vow to look again at recognising annexed Crimea as part of Russia must have put a smile on the faces of many Kremlin supporters. Of course, not everyone in Russia thinks Trump is their best bet. Some political analysts say his Democratic rival, Hillary Clinton, would benefit the Kremlin even more. At least she's predictable, they say, in her tough Russian stance. But it's the unpredictability of Trump that may have most endeared him to the Kremlin-controlled media. He will either be more inclined to uh, do a deal with the Kremlin or he will mess up life in the White House and on Capitol Hill so much by his erratic behavior that the American political class, the American system will be in permanent crisis. And that is what actually Russia wants. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. He may not be the Kremlin's man, in other words, but he might prove a useful distraction from what the Kremlin does. After the break, we have True Guy Sports. We'll have for you updates from Team PNG at the Rio Olympic Games. Stay with us. True Kai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. Young Papua New Guinean boxer Thaddeus Katua stepped onto the world stage in his opening fight of the 2016 Rio Olympic Games, giving his all and with the crowd behind him. Katua fell short on points to be beaten by his Russian opponent. Still in Rio and PNG's Raymond Ovenu lasted just 43 seconds in his 66 kilogram bout against Canadian Antoine Bouchard this morning. Ovenu, featuring in his second Olympic Games, was outclassed by his more experienced opponent. To the Rio Olympics progressive tally as of 4 o'clock this afternoon, the current medal tally was at USA, leading with 12 medals, 3 gold, 5 silver and 4 bronze. In second place, Japan holds a total of 8 medals, 3 gold, 2 silver and 3 bronze, while in third place, Australia pocketed 3 gold and 3 bronze. All three countries are hoping to increase their medal tally in synchronized swimming on August the 14th and gymnastics tomorrow. The tallies are progressive and are likely to change by tomorrow. Russia was barred from taking part in next month's Rio Paralympics on Sunday, with organizers criticizing a medals over morals mentality as they announced the blanket ban over state-backed doping that Olympics bosses avoided. International Paralympic Committee President Philip Craven said Russia's Paralympians were part of a broken system overseen by the Russian government and suspended the Russia Paralympic Committee ahead of the Paralympic Games set to be held from September 7th to the 18th. The IPC decision follows revelations of widespread cheating in Russian sport, which ignited a doping scandal that has threatened to split the Olympic movement and cost dozens of Russian sports people their place at the Rio Games. In my view, and in the view of every member of the IPC governing board, the McLaren report marked one of the darkest days in the history of all sport. It was a body blow for everyone who is committed to clean, fair and honest competition. It questioned the integrity and credibility of sport as we all know it and has left me and many others deeply saddened. The International Olympic Committee stopped short of banning all Russian sports people from Rio and said on Sunday 278 of the original 387 strong Russian team would be able to compete after being cleared by their individual sports federations. 
Russia announced within minutes of the announcement it would be appealing against the ban of the Court of Arbitration for Sport in Switzerland. Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Maria Zakharova said the ruling violated the human rights of Russia's Paralympians. Russian Paralympians toppled the medal tally at Sochi 2014 after taking second place behind China at London 2012 and their exclusion from the Rio Games will hit hard in a country which has long drawn pride and prestige from its history of sporting success. The move also further tarnishes the legacy of Sochi Olympics, an event held up by President Vladimir Putin to promote his image of Russia as a resurgent world power. Addressing Russia's Olympic team before they traveled to Rio last week, Putin said Russian sport had fallen foul of a politically motivated plot and the principle of collective responsibility flew in the face of common sense and legality. Dion Kombeng, National MTV Sports. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of True Guys Sports after these messages. Stay tuned. True Guys Sports. Welcome back to True Guys Sports. The SPPNG Hunters still maintain their position on third place after yesterday's 30 20 win against the Burley Bears. After the Bears' loss, they now drop down to second place on the Interest Super Cup ladder. The Hunters belted competition leaders Burley Bears 30 points to 20 on Sunday afternoon at the National Football Stadium in Port Moresby. Redcliffe Dolphins took over the top spot after beating East Tigers 28 points to 22. From 20 games played, the Hunters are on 32 points with 14 wins, 6 losses and 2 buys and a points for and against of 118. Is he going to go all the way? It's set here. Shut the gate! The horse has bolted! Thompson said it! The top 5 teams are Redcliffe Dolphins, Burley Bears, SP Hunters, Tansfield Blackhawks and East Tigers. The Hunters will play 3 more games before the finals. They travel to Kent this weekend to take on the Townsville Blackhawks. Then the following weekend, they take on Northam Pride in Barlow Park. Final match for the season will be a home game against the Sunshine Coast Falcons. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. To Rugby Union now and the Morabe Hammerheads have eased into the Export Rugby Championship Grand Final. Following yesterday's win over the East New Britain Kayas, Facing them in the final showdown will be Capital Rugby Union's Boromas side, who outmuscled the Guy Guys 2017 in the second do or die match at the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium. Despite the East New Britain Kayas having a wealth of experience in the backline, in the likes of Puk Puk's Henry Kalua, Eugene Tokavai, and Willie Tirang, just to name a few, the Hammerheads 15 men side successfully outmuscled the New Guinea Island heavyweights. As they remain scoreless for the majority of the first half, the Hammerheads maintain ball possession, finding themselves comfortably in the opposition's 22. And as the Kayas were one man down after being penalized for continuous obstruction in the scrum, the Hammerheads were headed down the right path of a grand final entry. <laughs> In Game 2, the Port Mosby Derby once again came to light as the Bormas and Guy Guys put on display their long-time rivalry on the field. The dynamic duo Tisa Kautu and Stenis Susuve were influential for the Bormas, controlling the game from the back line and setting up a number of plays. The experience in the front row with Wesley Thomas, Willie Rickies and Desmond Kopok also proved dominant in the scrums and rock and molds. As they managed to cross the line, and push for penalties from the forward pack. Eli Pemikini also a standout for the Guy Guys in the front row. But as the Barmas backline continued to outclass the Guy Guys, both teams certainly played quality rugby, as the final scoreline of 2017 itself speaks volumes of the talent possessed on both sides. Elijah Lavette, National MTV Sports. PNG Rugby Football Union's newly appointed performance manager Chris Lane is impressed with the current pool of talent that has become evident throughout the three weeks of the Export Rugby Championship. Lane says the quality of rugby played in the semi-finals of the championship was a boost for PNG Rugby as it will now make way for a wider player base for the national teams. I was, I was very impressed with what I saw yesterday. Um, two, two really good games of rugby. Um, Obviously, with the Morabo boys playing more more um, 15s than the than the boys from East New Britain, you now that sort of came through in the end. Um, but and the, and the second game, which was an all-capital rugby um, semi-final, again 
just the experience that was um, with the Boromers there, with those with those older, you know, more experienced type five forwards, sort of got them home in the end. But the standard of rugby, you know, it's it's very encouraging for the future for PNG rugby. This competition has been enormous for us here at PNG Rugby. It's you know it's, it's, it's helping us identify new talent uh, for both 15s and 7s. And you know, again, really looking forward to watching some quality rugby on Sunday. And that's where we're at Trukai Sports for tonight. We'll have for you the weather details for the next 24 hours when we come back. Trukai Sports. Forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Fine weather in Port Mosby, cloudy in Daru, Kerama, Alotau and Popendeta. To the Momasi region, rain and showers in Leh, rain in Wau, rain and showers in Madang, thundery rain expected in Wiwak and Vanimore. To the New Guinea Islands region, a shower or two expected in Larangau, Kavian, Kokopo and Rabao, showers and storms in Kimbe, rain and showers in Buka. And in the Highland region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, all these centres can expect showers with morning fog over the next 24 hours. And in news just in, a government delegation will travel to the Hyde's gas plant tomorrow in response to a recent petition that was presented to ExxonMobil by disgruntled landowners of PDL7. A ministerial delegation will follow on Wednesday. This was announced this afternoon by Petroleum and Energy Minister Nixon Duban. The minister said this afternoon that the main issue with the delay in payment of landowner benefits lies in properly identifying genuine landowners. So the consequence of paying the wrong people is the one that the state is concerned. And that has to be corrected for the future of the project. This project is going to be here for a long time. We cannot make a mess and pay wrong people. And so the onus is on the state to ensure it's done properly. Whether we take one year or we take a couple of months, we must ensure it is done properly. It is in the best interest of the people of Hela and our government to ensure that those names are properly registered, uh, properly identified. Yesterday, landowners from PDL7 sent a petition to ExxonMobil and the Prime Minister's office demanding answers with the delay in payments and accusing the government of using landowner money as collateral for state loans. And that money is not going to be touched, cannot be touched, and will not be touched until those issues are resolved. Acting Secretary of the Department of Petroleum and Energy, David Manau, said the process of identifying landowners have progressed in some areas, but has stalled in others due to dispute. The logistics are, are challenges and also funding. And, and, and I think at this point in time, uh, it's both the department and the ADR team faces the same issue of funding. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. Now recapping our main stories for tonight. Positive reactions to Enga Show. Australia says PNG responsible for Manu Center. And Thaddeus Katua goes down fighting in Rio. And that's the new sports and weather for tonight. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, have a pleasant evening. Good night.